Good afternoon. We'll start in just a few minutes, but um, before we do, I just wanted to make sure our to know if there are any um, educators here who are hoping for OPI renewal units. I have forms for you. All right, let me get you one of those. And if you have yours from last week, or uh, you just hold on to it, I'll sign it at the end. Um, you can get uh, and uh, just keep a hold of it till till the end of the series, or so you can't come anymore. Uh, and then you'll um, uh, submit those. Uh, all right. Um, my name is Martha Cole. I'm a historical specialist here. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you back for the the second installment in our Montana History in Nine Easy Lessons. If you were unable to make it last week for Jessica Bush's talk on the pre-contact uh, Montana, uh, I'm happy to report that that is up on YouTube. You can find a link on our YouTube channel, or um, um, we also have a link to it through our webpage. So if you go to our homepage and you click on the Montana History in Nine Easy Lessons, button, you can find the link to um, Jessica's talk, and uh, we'll also, for all of your friends who wish when you go back and rave about this talk, uh, it'll take a couple days, but we'll have this one up on YouTube as well. And uh, a little preview, I invite you back for next week uh, to hear Ellen Baumler talk about gold. But today, I'm really delighted to introduce Stan Wilmoth, who's going to be covering our early contact period. Uh, Stan started working for the Montana Historical Society in 1993. For much of his 24 years here, he has served as a state archaeologist in the Historic Preservation Program. He has a particular interest in places of unique concern to tribes. Uh, such as uh, traditional cultural properties like the Badger Two Medicine and Sweetgrass Hills. He received his PhD in 1987 from the University of California, Riverside, and taught at UM Helena for more than 20 years as an adjunct instructor, instructor for anthropology and Native American studies. So, with no further ado, Stan Wilmoth. Thank you, Martha, and th uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I have a, about 20 reference sheets up here, which is not nearly enough, I see. But um, for anyone who's interested in, uh, in some good references, uh, they might like to look further into today's topics. Uh, there are some classic references. And that's my email if, uh, if anyone wants to uh, get to me later about references or uh, ask me to try and clarify something that I uh, wasn't very clear on today. So I'll try and get back to you if, if you email me. Um, as you may know from having read uh, a description of today's topics, um, I'm planning to talk about the introduction of the horse, the fur trade, and diseases among Montana's early peoples. Um, the early, the uh, overly simplified version of the big story is pretty clear. Uh, Native peoples were displaced <coughs> and despoiled by outsiders, largely through guile, dishonesty, and disease. Um, that is not to say that Native people were not actively acquiring horses and participating in the trade very willingly. Uh, but beyond that, not understanding the diseases, and as we'll see, nobody at the time understood what was happening with epidemic diseases. It seems that no one could have foreseen how these horses interacted and were um, mutually interrelated. Today I hope to explain uh, in hindsight and from an anthropological perspective uh, some of how those forces were in fact systemically interrelated, each driving the others 
uh, into far-reaching consequences as native peoples found themselves in predicaments not of their own choosing. Uh, archaeologists, and some of you may have heard uh, Jessica talk about some of this last week, archaeologists group sites in Montana into the following periods, the Paleo or Early Period, the Archaic or Middle Period, and the Pre-Contact or Late Contact Period. Uh, we also recognize a proto-historic period which covers the time between 1491 and the time when face-to-face Euro-American contact actually occurred someplace along that frontier. So it's a moving chronological uh, boundary, particularly with proto-historic. Um, and I'll be focusing primarily on the proto-historic period today um, and the early historic period. The term proto-historic is important for focusing attention on the fact that many changes occurred long before Europeans arrived at any particular scene. I will be focusing on a few key points today and will take some liberties, such as when I refer to the fur trade, I will be jumbling up the fur, robe, and hide trade as they may be distinguished in longer discourse. And while I'll be focusing on the proto-historic, I would like to begin in the early pre-contact period about 2,000 years ago, and I'll end up in the historic period about 1875. <coughs> the later pre-contact period is generally recognized archaeologically by the shift from middle period dart points to arrow sized points and the presence of pottery. That doesn't really do us archaeologists much good when we're focusing on the pre-contact because those artifacts disappear almost immediately. They stop being used within one or two generations and are replaced by European trade goods as soon as they're available. The early paleo or early late period people, of course, were experts in a hunting and gathering way of life, which has some important ramifications. Generally, hunter-gatherers live in small-scale egalitarian groups with low population densities, and they rarely participate very intensively in exterior systems. But in Montana, we see that population seemingly was increasing during the late period, following a stable or falling population during the archaic period. As evidence, certainly oversimplified evidence, uh, we can count prehistoric sites with C14 dates in eastern Montana. And if we do that, all of those that have carbon-14 dates will account for 54% of all of the sites in eastern Montana. So for a period of 1,700 years, perhaps, 54% of the sites date from that, that period. The other 12,000 years is covered by less than half that number of sites. The sites also get larger. They have many more features, and the features get larger. So teepee rings get larger. There's uh, 10 times as many um, rock cairns and other internal features. So as I said, at a very simple level, it seems to indicate that the population was growing at the end of the late period. Um, for anthropologists, this is a not an expected trajectory of human occupation. Um, Hunter-gatherers normally control their population pretty effectively. Um, wherever hunter-gatherers lived long enough to be studied by outsiders, such as South America, Africa, the Arctic, um, we see that their population was very limited, and they had limited the accumulation of material goods and the labor to produce it. Child care and the lack of transportation seemed to be the most limiting factor in limiting transportation and the accumulation of goods. Mothers simply can't carry more than one child while moving, foraging, and accomplishing everything else that she needs to do for the household. So life births were limited to one every three to five years. There were also 
very high 50% child mortality rates in most hunter-gatherer groups. Together, that meant very stable and low population densities. Property accumulation was limited for similar reasons. And if you can imagine carrying everything that you own either in your own arms or on the back of some dogs, um, you'd have to get rid of a lot of stuff. Um, we also know from these hunter-gatherer studies that families lived in small groups of, say, 25, but rarely more than 50, and possibly seasonally up to 200. The 95% of those folks were relatives by marriage or birth. Most, if not all, of the men were fathers and hunters, and all of the women were mothers and gatherers and processors. Everyone was similarly employed, and egalitarianism and consensus was very high. Leadership was by consensus and based on competence, which all could see. It was there for them to see. And by generosity that it produced. Conflict was limited and intermittent. Group fission, rather than violence, resolved most issues. And again, gener generosity was the source of most influence among relatives and potential relations. It also evened the ebb and flow of natural variability in resources. But at some point, that ideally, perhaps simplified version of hunter-gatherer life began to change in Montana, especially as we get closer to the historic, proto-historic period. Um, we see less and less evidence of that egalitarianism, for example. Populations seem to be increasing, although we don't know when or why exactly. In my own mind, production of storable food in the form of pemmican, dried meat, grease, and berries, became intensified, as indicated by copious amounts of firecracked rock and crushed bone in late period occupation and processing sites. Additionally, during the late period, we see human remains with late period stone points embedded in them, and two particularly important sites, the Hagen and the Nolmeyer site in eastern Montana, appear to represent colonization of Montana by Native American horticulturalists with permanent or semi-permanent housing and defensive ditches. Both sites have been intentionally burned down um, before um, 1,500 years ago. At Crow Creek, a similar, albeit larger town in central South Dakota on the Missouri River, um, 500 citizens were murdered mutilated and thrown into the defensive ditches about 1350. And further southeast at Cahokia, outside East St. Louis, was a city of at least 15,000 and maybe 40,000 people with walls, defensive ditches, and temple mounds. If the surrounding area population was as high as estimated, it would be the largest North American city until 1840 Philadelphia. Cahokia was abandoned about 300, or I'm sorry, 1,300 years ago. In some ways, not understood, it's clear that things were changing rapidly as we approached the proto-historic period. I believe that the trade in meat and skins between the people in Montana and the larger semi-permanent residential um, towns and cities further east may be one of the reasons that that happened. And of course, that included potential conflict al along some 1491 frontier of hunter-gatherers versus horticulturalists. But the view from Montana, as someone has said, is very hazy. We have evidence of further trade links with the outside. Gulf Coast conch shells have been found in the Sweetgrass Hills, Chert was imported from the Dakotas, Obsidian was obtained from Idaho and Wyoming. And as John Ewer says, there are always two sides to each frontier. Skins, robes, and dried meat are mentioned in early oral accounts of the pre-contact Mandan-Hibatsa trade fairs 
as being brought in by the so-called nomads, but transportation by dog was very limiting. Many anthropologists believe that by the, light, by the late period, mass bison hunts could at will produce 75 to 200 animals at any time. But how to move it all and why process it all if you can only move it on two or three dogs? Between 1350 and 1850, there was also a climatic interval known as the Little Ice Age, which, which may have raised bison populations to record densities, but that in and of itself does not explain the increased production that I am proposing. The oral accounts detailed bundle exchanges, purchase membership in dance, military, and religious associations, as well as exchange in material culture at the Mandan Hidatsa rendezvous. In any case, a vibrant exchange system seems to have been in place before 1491, as was an organized and formal system of warfare. This is best evidenced by the communal, I'm sorry, ceremonial rock art style depicting armored warriors often masked in formations dating from a thousand years ago to say 1500. Bear Gulch in uh, Fergus County outside Lewis town is uh, one of the most accessible places to view that art. Uh, if you look at it uh, on Google, you'll find a place where you can uh, tour those sites. Weatherman Draw in Carbon County near the Wyoming border is another world-class example of that rock art style. Um, the first major impact of Euro-American presence that was still far to the east and south may have been the appearance of horses, horses ridden by Shoshone warriors. Horses at once revolutionized and intensified warfare. They made commodity hunting, trade, and wealth accumulation much more intensive as well. Horses were needed for warfare, trade, and transportation. They became a value for transporting goods, but they were also a standard unit of value in and of themselves. The repercussions of having access to horses is almost unlimited when we think about material culture. Uh, teepees became larger. Uh, they stopped using teepee rings because of um, metal tools. Um, camp circles took the place of parallel lines of teepees, for example. And that way, they were more defensive against mounted riders, and they also ended up keeping their horses inside the camp circle. Um, it, as I said earlier, stone tools, pottery disappeared almost immediately. Almost every item that um, trade goods could uh, replace was replaced almost immediately. There were very uh, many factors which varied tribal responses and strategies. For example, the horticultural villages never acquired enough horses so that every family had even one horse all the time. And if they did, they were usually lost to raiders. In the middle Missouri, a Pawnee village of 300 might have 150 or 200 horses. But to the north here in Montana, the Crow had over 10,000 horses in the 1800s, the Blackfeet almost as many, the Coeur d'Alene and Flathead perhaps more. Maximilian in the 1830s tells of a Blackfoot leader with four to 5,000 horses, of which 150 were killed and 100 others given away at his death. There was large variability and range in the wealth within and between all the tribal groups, and as a result, the division of labor varied from merely just having hunters and gatherers, everyone being a hunter and a gatherer, to societies where there were professional hunters, professional herders, raiders, horse trainers, bundle holders, curers, saddle makers, and all kinds of other occupations. This, of course, lowered egalitarianism 
and hence consensus. No longer was leadership merely the basis on generosity and competence. Among the Kiowa, for example, there were four named ranks that were somewhat hereditary. In fact, some early writers call them castes. Polygyny increased in the North, in part at least due to the pemmican trade and later to the robe and gun trade, but that did not affect the Kiowa and other Southern groups which were out of reach of the trade forts. For tribes in the North, guns quickly became the best weapon against mounted enemies, and they were the ones with the, the best access to guns. Very quickly, the sex ratio of adult males to adult women fell as a result of more intensive war losses. Similarly, the age at marriage changed so that in some groups, 12-year-old girls were married to 35-year-old men. In the early 1800s, for the 35-year-old cohort, there were three to four women for every adult male in most Plains groups. And while captives had been adap adopted previously, about this time, women prisoners began to be exchanged to the northern traders. Traders needed pemmican and horses as the trading forts moved out of the forest in Canada and white middlemen replaced Cree and Assiniboine middlemen. Guns became the single most important trade item by 1800. Some nations, such as the Blackfeet, blockaded gun trade to the west and the south, and thus few guns reached the Kootenai until the 1800s when fate Fort Kootenai was built by the Northwest Fur Company to bypass the Blackfeet. And of course, that increased local conflict between the Blackfeet and the Northwest Company very quickly. In 1850, one gun brought five to 10 bison robes. Prices were higher as one moved west and to the south away from the forts. By 1870, prices had doubled. The scale of the trade increased as horses allowed continuous hunting and effective transport. Guns and horses became units of value. And one example that caught my eye was the Crow in 1805 bought horses from the Shoshone rendezvous and sold them in less than six months for a 100% markup at the Mandan Hidatsa rendezvous, getting 200 guns for 250 horses. Between 1835 and 1843, the American Fur Company traded 70,000 robes annually, while previously the Hudson Bay Company had shipped 10,000. 20,000 robes were shipped each year from Fort Benton alone between 1841 and 1870. The robe and later hide trade exacerbated the trend towards polygyny. David Thompson, who worked for both the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Fur Company reported in 1787 and 1800 that three or four wives were common in the North. Henry the Younger reported 10 years later that six to seven wives were not uncommon. Maximilian in 1830 stated wealthy leaders often had eight wives. Grinnell reconstructing patterns from genealogies in the 1840s said only the very poor men had less than four wives while some had 12 and at least one had 16. Arthur Ray and Oscar Lewis using Northwest Mounted Police records note extreme cases in 1874 of 20 and 30 wives. At that time, the police and the church were trying to discourage such marriages and Father Point had explained in 1847 why they were not having very much luck. <laughs> he explained first that nearly three quarters of all adults were females, but what is more, he went on to quote a Blackfeet leader who said, he loved each one of his eight wives, but eight wives could produce 150 robes a year, while one could only do 10 robes along with the rest of her household work. As I said, guns were not the only item in the trade, and the homeland exhibit outside the hall there uh, ha is, is, um, has some great examples of trade items and beautiful examples of how Native peoples adapted them to their particular needs. 
Stone points, knives, native pottery disappear immediately as European replacements of every kind were available, including alcohol. Without meaning to stretch the point, though, it seems clear that the quality of life for women was a very likely major forfeit in the fur trade. Household conflicts and rivalry between men exacerbated the commoditization of women's labor, and yet there was more. Horses and the fur and row trade were also related to the increasing introduction of diseases as the horses and trade increased the frequency and need of contact as well as decreasing the travel time to and from numerous trade ports and rendezvous. With horses, people traveled hundreds of miles during the time infections were incubating and before symptoms sh appeared. When Lewis and Clark entered Montana, they entered a landscape in which vibrant peoples had, been in, had already been adapting and adjusting to rapid and unpredictable forces. Now among those forces were introduced 25 new disease agency agents from the Far East, Africa, and Europe. One list, according to the yearbook of physical anthropology in 1992, uh, includes the following diseases. Smallpox, measles, influenza, bubonic plague, diphtheria, typhus, cholera, scarlet fever, chicken pox, yellow fever in the south, malaria, uh, whooping cough, uh, anthrax, strains of staph, strains of streptococcus. Um, I'm not going to read them all. Um, Syphilis is on this list. I believe at this point syphilis is generally not included in these lists. Um, new DNA evidence tends to indicate that syphilis um, may not have been introduced from Europe or elsewhere. Uh, but what I want to talk about um, specifically at this point is smallpox. Smallpox is the most widely discussed in the literature and in the history, probably because of its virulence and its visibility. It's exceedingly difficult to distinguish among several different diseases in historical sources prior to the recognition and classification of bacteria and viruses. Worldwide, smallpox has an average fatality rate of 30%, somewhat higher in younger children, and as we know, confers resistance in survivors. Perhaps because of the latter two characteristics, epidemics on the American frontier seem to occur every 18 to 20 year cycle, depending on population density and population recovery in non-urban populations. We would expect lower rates of epidemic infection in mobile and low density populations, such as hunter gatherers in the low and the late period. In those mobile and low density populations, smallpox is known to burn itself out. That is to say, it kills so many people that there are no surviving hosts that are not resistant to it very quickly. But that's an important question to wonder about. Were these populations real, true hunter-gatherers, or were they something else? And I'll, I'll return to that question in just a little bit. It's also important to remember that in Europe at the time, an estimated 400,000 people died of smallpox every year during this same period. It wasn't until after 1800 when inoculations and quarantines slowed it down. In proto-historic Native America, communities with much regular intercourse, rapidly growing populations, as far as I can see, infections spread rapidly and widely. In North America, Native and trader witnesses account, witness accounts um, 
commonly state that between 66% and 90% of local communities did not survive smallpox. The disparity in new world and worldwide fatality rates, as well as the near lack of accurate and unambiguous census data has led to passionate disputes between anthropologists who are known as high counters and the low counters. Two original low counters were Krober and Mooney, who early on estimated at the end of the 1800s that there had been about 8 million native persons for the entire hemisphere. Looking at historical records and the new estimates of disease rates in 1966, Dobbins revisited those estimates and he revised them upward to numbers such as 90 million and 112 million people. Dobbins believed that the low numbers had been mistaken because they did not take into account smallpox such as diseases such as smallpox that would have resulted in one out of five persons at least being killed between within 150 years of contact. Without any new primary data, the, the pendulum the pendulum in research has swung back and forth. I believe today that most researchers lean towards the higher numbers, but perhaps not so high as Dobbins. Um, so what does that mean to us in practical terms? If we think of our own families and our neighbors perhaps around us, if one out of three persons were gone tomorrow, that would be a low count scenario. And if we looked around this room and imagined that only one person out of every 10 was left by the end of the year, that would be a high count scenario. And in fact, that's almost one person per row, maybe not quite so much, but as you can imagine, that means for any community, priests, leaders, experts at almost everything will be disappearing very fast. And in any case, any community would be staggered, whether it was a high or the low count. Some would be chaotic and others may cease to exist as organized communities. But even if smallpox did not cause two-thirds or nine-tenths of the losses, remember on top of it, Whereas the flu, diphtheria, typhus, cholera, yellow fever, and further south, diseases such as malaria and bubonic plague, wherever population densities and other conditions allowed. So let's look at smallpox a little bit closer. The first accepted smallpox epidemic in New England occurred apparently in 1619 when African slave children were shipped in. By that time, 1920, in Mexico, it's estimated by Dobbins and other high counters that only 3% of the original population was left. Eight million people in central Mexico would have died in the capital, Tenochtitlan. At least one and a half million people would have died within 120 years of contact. Smallpox reached our Great Lakes by 1633. Whether it's a coincidence or a cause, it's interesting to note that that's about the same period when the Cheyenne and other woodland tribes started moving west. And in fact, that became part of a continental pattern. In the southeast United States, smallpox epidemics are recorded in 1729, 1738, and 1753. The Cherokee Nation went from 50,000 people to 25,000 people in that time period. It's well to remember in perspective perhaps that in England during that same time period, 30% child mortality un for children under 15 every year due not only to smallpox, but dysentery, scarlet fever, whooping cough, flu, and pneumonia. In Boston, 
Smallpox epidemics were recorded six times between 1636 and 1698, again in 1721 and 1770. The 1770 epidemic had repercussions for the American Revolution, but it also reached far into the Dakotas and affected unknown numbers of people there. On the West Coast, the Russians were landing epidemics between 1768 and 1779. We have no information on how far east those epidemics may have reached. Some of you will be familiar with the Delaware and Shawnee tribes that were affected, perhaps intentionally, by smallpox, which may have been introduced by the British during the siege of Fort Pitt in 1763. It spread as far as Ohio with at least 66% fatality. More important perhaps for today's talk is the 1780 epidemic which struck the horticultural villages on the Missouri and the Mississippi where I've mentioned the trade rendezvous. The Blackfeet stories, the oral histories, um, point to their having been exposed to the disease in Saskatchewan by Shoshone raiders whom they found dead in their tents um, And I think for me, the picture that that paints is that they left uh, before symptoms showed up and they died before the Blackfeet found them. The incubation period for smallpox is between 10 and 12 days as, as far as I understand. The Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara were particularly hard hit in the 1780 <coughs> epidemic. The Mandans had numbered 12,000 people but were reduced to less than 4,000 in 1782. Localized non-pandemics occurred along the Missouri in 1800 and 1804. About this time, back in the States, inoculations and quarantine practices were helping to limit what was still a ubiquitous infection in denser urban populations. In 1837, the American Fur Company steamer, the SS St. Peter, brought smallpox to the upper Missouri again. This time there were eyewitnesses, British and American traders, and their accounts all state that at least 66% of the population was lost. The American Fur Company blamed Arikara women who had boarded the ship days before showing any signs of the illness. By the time the epidemic had run its course, there were fewer than 400 Mandan. Some observers, including Charbonneau, said that there were less than 50 people left. Soon thereafter, the Mandan, Arikara, and Hodatsa merged into one village. Remnants of a less than 1,000 persons from a combined population which would have existed in perhaps 100 villages and totaled over 50,000 people. <coughs> so to sum up and, and hopefully leave a chance for some discussion or some questions, the changes brought with horses, the fur trade, and disease must have been unrelenting interrelated, they were transformative and at times overwhelming, but at every term, if we look carefully, we see meaningful, rational, tribal responses as the tribes adjusted as best they could in the face of overwhelming odds and forces. Going back to the low counters and the fight with the high counters, um, it seems to me that the low counters were wrong, yes, in part because they did not take into account the very high loss rates but I also think that it's important to remember that their baseline estimate of population was very low to begin with. 
we were not talking about traditional hunter-gatherers. We were talking about people with very complex international trade relations that probably were experiencing very rapid population growth prior to the disease introduction. Given the presence of thousands, some thousands of native people in Montana in 1804, it has always struck me that Lewis and Clark could have traveled two thirds of the way across the state over th a period of four and a half months and seen no one until meeting the Shoshone in Beaverhead County. I can only imagine that the forces that I've tried to summarize today have something to do with that situation, but I don't know exactly what. Um, so that's, that's what I have today. If there are questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. If not, um, 